Hey, it's Jay. I wanted to extend a special thanks to those of you who have listened and left reviews on iTunes for this podcast. Please leave a review if you haven't done so already. We sincerely appreciate it. We're producing this show independently, and unfortunately, that is not free. We have to pay for digital hosting space, software, equipment, websites, and travel out of our own pockets. But we'd love to keep this show going as long as possible. Please show your support for this podcast and give it life by making a donation to www.bigbuckregistry.com forward slash donate or pledge your support by visiting www.bigbuckregistry.com forward slash pledge. You can also find our app in our Apple App Store called Big Buck Deer Hunter 2015 and in the Google Play Store for Google and Android devices. Thanks for your support and enjoy the show. Big Buck Registry's Big Buck Deer Hunting Podcast, episode number 115. Brandon Grindle from Buck 50, Deer Hunting Inside City Limits. Big Buck Registry is a virtual museum of hunting stories. We preserve a piece of Americana by interviewing and recording hunters about their hunts and experiences from across the country. And who knows, maybe we'll learn a thing or two along the way that'll help us take our hunt to the next level. Hey everybody, this is Craig Cushman at Hunter Specialties, and you're getting ready to hear another great podcast from the Big Buck Registry's Deer Hunting Podcast. Hi there, this is Dan Spencer from Des Moines, Iowa, and I'm an urban deer hunter. Get ready for another great episode with Jay and Dusty on the Big Buck Registry's Big Buck Deer Hunting Podcast. Hi, this is Michael Montgomery from the Hoosick Area QDM Co-op, and I shot Buck Nasty. And you're listening to my favorite hunting podcast ever, Jay and Dusty on the Big Buck Registry's Big Buck Podcast. Welcome to another episode of the Big Buck Registry's Big Buck Deer Hunting Podcast. Hope you're having a fantastic day. Uh, I certainly am, and it's got that crisp coolness in the air, and I'm sure some of you that are listening to this have engaged in a bow hunt somewhere, and many of you others that are listening to this probably haven't but want to like I do badly. So, uh, And I'm sure the, the fellow on the other line with me right now is thinking about it too, Dusty Phillips from Ohio. What's happened, Dusty? Uh, I've, quit, I've quit thinking about hunting. You are a liar. I have. And why would you do that? Because I'm ready to hunt. I ain't ready to think about it anymore. I'm ready to hunt. Dude, I, you know, I had this. I'm like, I'm like jealous of all these people that are posting pictures with bucks already. I got to figure out how to hunt in Utah. They have, they have like the earliest season that starts anywhere. Yeah, Kentucky's been in since like the first of September. Right. I know. People are showing me some big bucks, and I'm a bit envious, uh, but I, I don't have any plans to travel, and I'm just going to wait for the season to roll around in New Hampshire. And I think you're waiting too, right? It hasn't opened up in Ohio. No, I'm not, not yet. It's 26 September, Ohio opens up, okay. and uh, you know, I'm, I'm excited about it, but yet I'm holding out a little bit, but that, that's okay. That, yeah. That, you know, I, I got, I got uh, some pretty exciting things coming for me as far as, you know, some situations I'll be able to hunt in this year, and, and opportunity to go to New Hampshire and hunt with you is going to be perfect. I'm psyched about that. You know, I stepped outside today, and there was a, it was a, it was a coolness in there. Now, it, it wasn't it wasn't cold, but and it was still had some some temperature to it. But there was a cool rain that started to, to fall, and just I just you know stopped for a second to think about me in a ground blind or just moving through the woods with my bow and arrow, and this mist on your face, and just you know seeing a deer start to move and pulling that arrow up and getting drawn back and getting ready, and it just it brought back every ounce of love i have for this this sport that I, that you can imagine i wasn't even doing it i was just you know thinking about it right it doesn't take much to bring that uh the drive and the, the energy of hunting back yeah. to you it's like i could i could tell in ohio here it's getting close yeah you know, drive down the road and the corn's starting to dry out and the soybeans are turning yellow they're starting to lose their leaves in a lot of places it's not very far yeah it was it was that thing that happened, you know, would if it was five days later, I would have been grabbing the bow and heading in the field. It's one of those types of days. Right, yeah, for sure. So Dusty, I wanted to continue on our exploration of urban hunting. Uh, you know, we talked to Dan Spencer last week and he sh- shared some uh, pretty serious 
urban hunting where he's hunting in parks and he has to get permission and go through the proficiency testing. I wanted to expand upon that. And I, I've reached out to a fellow by the name of Brandon Grindle, who is down in Georgia. So we're going to Georgia this week to discuss a little bit more of the urban type setting where he's hunting, not necessarily in parks, but in very, very tight quarters, uh, small tracks of land, small pieces of woods uh, that lead basically up to people's backyards where he has to strategically find places to hunt in order to um, be successful and ask a lot of permission and ultimately hunt in somebody's backyard because that's the area he's in within city limits in in a uh, city in Georgia. It's going to be insane. Some of the, the stories that he is about to tell us will, will kind of blow you away if you're not used to that kind of thing. You know, I'm used it to really the big will. woods. You're used to the country life and the, the right. hunting, the, the big fields. And, and I'm just not used to hunting in somebody's backyard. I mean, there's things in this podcast you don't want to miss. Right. This stuff that we've, we've never really talked about before. What could happen in somebody's backyard? Yeah. And not that I wouldn't what try. Happen, what could happen when you're getting ready to go hunt in somebody's backyard? Right. There's all kinds of different options, you know. You get into nice, fine homes, and the anti-hunters are in the area. And Man, it's, it's going to be an intense podcast, Jay. Makes it a bit of an adventure. So uh, without further ado, let's go get Brandon Grindle on the phone and see what it's like uh, suburban hunting in Georgia. Brandon Grendel, welcome to the Big Buck Registry's Big Buck Deer Hunting Podcast. What's happening? It's doing good. Thanks for having me here. I'm excited to talk a little hunting with you guys this evening. Yeah, man. I'm talking. I like to talk hunting too. I'm I'm psyched about that. So we got Brandon Grendel from Buck Fifty, and you had talked to me about Buck Fifty a while back, and I said, you know what, I really like that name. And how that? How did you come up with that name? I, I've been wanting to ask you this for a while. Where'd that come from? Well, you know, I can't really take a whole lot of credit of. It's actually a group of three of us, myself, uh, my partner, Ryan Locke, and partner, Alan Crawford. Uh, you know, we've all been hunting buddies for the past few years. Myself and Ryan, we've been we've been partners probably for 10 years hunting. And uh, Ryan's actually the guy who came up with that name. We were just sitting in, uh, in the kitchen one day talking about, you know, the dream of just filming hunts and sharing it with people. And and he just comes out and he blurts the name. I mean, no reason at all. Uh, we really have no background as far as why we liked it. We just we were looking for something creative, something catchy, uh, something that people would remember and maybe relate to a little bit. So uh, that's you know nothing special. It just it kind of happened. So maybe it was meant to be. <laughs> so buck fifty. So is it a, a, in reference to a dollar fifty or a hundred and fifty dollars or something completely <laughs> other than that? You know, we get the joke. Sometimes people say that we're all only worth 50 cents a piece since there's only three of us. But, uh, <laughs> you know, then that's not really the case. You know, I, I guess it comes down to, uh, you know, that chase uh, for us. And I know all over the country, it's, you know, deer are different. But uh, chasing that 150-inch deer, you know, it's just a dream come true, something we'll do. And uh, maybe we'll get there. Maybe we'll pass it. Who knows? But, uh, it, you know, it definitely re- relates to that's the trophy for us guys down here in Georgia. Right on. I was going to ask you about the Georgia thing. So you're, you're talking about, you know, 150-inch class deer and how many of those exist in and around the areas you're hunting <laughs> you know uh i'll tell you our top 10 is 151 inches and our number 10 with a bow is 129 inches so uh that tells you they are here um but they are very very few of them and we we've got some good deer in this area and it's actually blowing up i guess more hunters are coming around here now that all these big deer are coming out of the woodworks but uh they are few and far between I, I've, I've had a privilege to hunt some of the, the better areas in this in this general re- region here and to be honest i haven't had 150 on camera yet <laughs> gotcha all right and, and that's that's going to happen it's um just we, 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 we can change that here in ohio for you oh yeah i'm sure you can uh, yeah, Dusty starts at a buck fifty and goes up. Oh, really? Yeah, <laughs> that's only our dreams down here. We're still waiting for the day to even see one. <laughs> I consider it a doe anything like below one thirty. It's a doe. <laughs> <laughs> oh, now you're just hurting my feelings. Right. Now <laughs> I'm just being serious, man. You know, it, hey, it's a good way to I look know. at it. Yeah, Dev, you know, we've been, we've got out state Illinois the past few years, and they tell us they don't pick their bows up for anything under one hundred fifty, and probably not even then. Right, yeah, you know, it, it, the caliber of bucks are different. You know, it, it's, it's just they uh, are the genetics here and, and the 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 uh, nutritional value of crop areas we have is phenomenal. But yeah, you you can actually just just to get on that tangent for a second, or not off tangent, but you can actually set your areas up to to have the same mineral and, and supplement that we have here with a little bit of knowledge and some technique out there in your woods. Oh yeah, definitely. I mean, there's. 
like I said, I mean, they are here. It's just really understanding what a what a trophy for our area is and what's not. I mean, we've, you know, I mean, just outside of my neighborhood, I've had beer on camera. Uh, neighbors of mine have, I mean, that are in the 160s, 170s. And as like I said, with a 150 being a top, that's a absolute giant for these parts. But uh, we just don't have the nutrition in the agriculture that you guys up north do. So that's definitely a, a little bit of a disadvantage for us. Now, what's funny, Brandon, is when you said that, you say up north. I'm even further north than all both of you guys, and my, the nutritional value in the New, well, the New Hampshire forest, quite frankly, is um, <laughs> not producing big racks either. So I kind of understand where you're coming from, but where you are, yeah. we're definitely hunting three different, completely different territories. Oh that, yeah. That being said, what's the forecast for Georgia this year? You know, uh, they I've heard that they're expecting a a really rough winter um to us rough you know if we get an inch of snow down here in atlanta they start shutting down highways and people start abandoning their cars so uh <laughs> i don't know what they're thinking rough is but uh i mean we you know a couple years past we've had up to 10 12 inches and that like i said that's a that's a blizzard for us down here so uh they're saying we're to expect a little bit more than uh than we have in these recent years uh hopefully that's a nice cold fall for us because uh these last few years it's been pretty warm all the way up into november and december right yeah, you know, a foot of snow is is like, I don't know, a quarter, sunny day. <laughs> yeah, it's a sunny day. It's a quarter inch of rain, and you know that yeah. that stuff falls, you know, on Halloween for us sometimes. So that wow. we literally had about a foot of snow two years ago on Halloween. <laughs> so I, yeah, I, but it's it's a different landscape completely where you're hunting and tell us a little bit more about exactly where that is not not like gps coordinates where your tree stands are but just where whereabouts in georgia are you well i'm actually a lot of my stands are actually on the on the side lands of lake lanier um i don't know if you guys have ever heard of it that's actually one of the it's one of the largest man-made lakes i know in the southeast it may be in the nation so uh, that's a that's a really big tourist attraction for our parts and uh so i'm in hall i'm in hall county though uh we're about 45 minutes directly north of atlanta um and like i said all my spots are just right on lakeside and uh maybe that's what keeps them all coming in all these travel it's it's real small woods all neighborhoods backyards um downtown city limit spots uh, it ranges but nothing nothing large um, i've got spots from three quarters of an acre to my largest was uh at one point 50 acres but probably only about 15 of it was huntable gotcha okay so how long have you been involved in this aspect of this particular landscape is this something you've engaged in all your life or is this something that you were introduced to at some point well uh, before uh, I'm, I'm a senior in college right now okay. so i've been out of high school four years and uh, i'd never picked up a bow till my uh my sophomore year in high school and reason being is uh i grew up hunting with my dad down in south georgia just your typical we'd go to you know a, a hunting club we call it and uh and our, our cabin burnt down and right at that time the kind of the economy crashed a little bit and with funds being low we weren't able to get in another spot and uh, a buddy of mine he introduced me to bow hunting and ever since 10th grade. So, I mean, I'm going on, I guess, about eight years now is when I really, and at that point too, that was in, at my age is when I really started getting into hunting and teaching myself. So, uh, it hadn't been long for me. It's only been uh, eight short years and, uh, I've started pretty much from scratch because as everyone knows, bow hunting and gun hunting, they are not, they're not, not the same. All the tactics and techniques are different. Absolutely. Now, are you bow hunting exclusively now or is it a bow gun situation? Um, I am mainly bow hunting. I do like to break the rifle out if I get an opportunity. Um, let's see, last year, I don't even think I brought it out once. The year before, I got it out once. So I am, I guess you could say, exclusively bow hunting. That's awesome, man. Um, t tell me about your experience with the bow. What um, what drew you to that? And do you like it better than gun? If you had to pick one, which one's the best? Oh, I'd by far the, the bow. I mean, just the thrill and the adrenaline you get is just, it's night and day and, uh, and no, like I said, I, I would have never, I don't think I would have ever really picked up the bow, really, if uh, if if that accident down at our club getting struck by lightning and burning down would have happened. Uh, I guess I was really just thrown into it at that time. I was just freshman in, in high school. I wasn't really able to drive and uh, and to really to get away to any of the big the big land, you're, you're two or three hours away from, from where we are. So 
I was kind of just thrown into uh, thrown into it. I mean, we had we had some small town boat archery shoots, and I started doing that. So that kind of got me really shooting. And then I started thinking, well, hey, you know, maybe I can just pop out here. Uh, you know, I had some neighbors that owned some land behind the neighborhood, and they let us do a little hunting. And that's really how I got thrown into it. I mean, literally, it's like getting thrown in the water without a life jacket. I had no no guide, no nothing. I just had my little bit of foundational of what I thought at the time how deer how deer moved and. Uh, you know, acted during different times of the season. Gotcha. So did, did you have somebody that kind of introduced you to the bow or is, is, was that just something like you picked up a magazine one day and said, Hey, that looks cool. I want to try that. Where did a that buddy come from? of mine, a, a longtime friend, buddy of mine named Christian Martin. Uh, he's really the one he, uh, he had a bow and he shot a little bit again. He was an amateur at that time as well. But uh, he, he's the one who really introduced me. I mean, we got off as soon as we got off the bus, it was, we ran to the house, we grabbed our bows, we shot all day till dark. I mean, that's all we did. I mean, I can't even explain the kind of joy we got from it. So that's how I was really introduced, just backyard shooting, just messing around. I mean, whenever I first picked up the bow, it wasn't really even a, I'm getting a bow to hunt. It was just a shoot and just to, to do something different. And then I started kind of figuring out, uh, you know, how, just how to get out in the woods and be productive with it. All right. So you got introduced to the bow itself, the, the instrument and I call it an instrument because it is kind of like playing an instrument. It's um, oh yeah. There's a technique to it. When did you decide to transition the instrument into a weapon uh, for hunting? I would say um, probably about six, seven years ago. Right after I picked it up and started and started actually again at the time what I thought I was getting accurate and pretty good with it. Uh, I immediately, I mean, I've I've never had a year off of hunting. So even between the transition of, of hunting club to this backyard hunting with a bow, I was immediately drawn to wanting to learn to get better and uh, just how it all worked. Because like I said, I mean, it was just, I was clueless. Just everything was all, was all new to me at the time. Right. Gotcha. So how did you start to develop your skill set? I mean, you don't just pick up a bow one day and go hunting the next <laughs> um, what was what was it like? What were the trials and tribulations and the tri- the errors that you made? Wow, I mean, whenever I first picked up a bow, I didn't even had one, and uh, and I actually had my buddy, like I told you, introduce me. He actually had to help me pull his bow back. You know, I was muscular, but a a 65 pound bow even was, I couldn't get it back just as muscles are different. So, you know, he actually had to help me get start getting the bow back just to shoot and learn the, the technique of shooting. But as far as getting out in the woods, I mean, it was just completely trial and error. I had I had zero clue how to read up close sign and um, and cover, finding trees with cover. And uh, I mean, the whole first year and a half, two years, I didn't I didn't take a, a deer with the bow. Gotcha. And how many deer did you see during that time frame? Oh, I mean, there was there was a lot of times we see deer a lot. Uh, I mean, we'd go out and see three or four deer sit, and sometimes we wouldn't see any. So, I mean, the deer were there, and the deer were in range. And there were there were a lot of arrows flying, but uh, that comes with, like I said, not being close enough for my comfort zone. I'm, you know, as a as a, a new guy shooting a, a bow, I'm shooting at deer at 30, 35 yards, which are past some guys' comfort zones who's been shooting for twenty years as a as a first time first year shooter. And, uh, and just missing and just wouldn't having any luck. And, and a lot of that has, you know, when you're up in a tree stand, your technique with a bow, if you don't realize it, it has to be the same anchor points, all that stuff when you're in a tree or when you're shooting flat. And a lot of that I was missing at the time. So I just couldn't connect on any deer. Gotcha. So what did you do over the time frame to start to hone in on your kill shot? Well, like I said, I've always been, from from day one when I shot, I've always been into, a, we kind of had some indoor range shooting and stuff. So, I mean, it was every day shooting target, shooting up there. Uh, that kind of got you under a little bit of pressure because you're shooting against, I mean, full guys who are full 3D archers uh, shooting 298s out of 300s and 300s. So getting that kind of pressure really helped. Um, it's just the repetition of shooting and trial and error of, of getting out there is what really helped me. And I can even say, I mean, like I said, I started as a freshman, sophomore in high school. I didn't really start having success until my senior year of high school with a bow. So it took that long to really, I mean, year two, year three, I, you know, I'd, I'd stick a dough or something like that, but I never really had great success until about four years into it. Okay. Gotcha. So what, what's your philosophy on hunting? I mean, it's, it's kind of relative to where you are, I guess, uh, or not, I guess it is. You have to have a certain style, a certain technique, a certain belief and kind of what to take and what not to take. How do you decide? 
You know, around here, uh, I think, to be honest with you, a lot of philosophies fail because there's there's so much pressure. There's so much illegal activity as far as hunters coming where you're not supposed to be. Um, my, my, my biggest thing is just getting out in the woods and being there when they're there. I mean, I'll, to be honest, and I, some urban hunting people, there's, there's some technique and stuff to it, but out here, this, it just all fails whenever you're on 10, 10, 15 acres and you got four other guys that are, that actually have access to it and stuff like that. Uh, it really is. Um, it's just putting the time in and effort and learning your land and learning your gear herd that you actually do have. And, um, and that's, you know, that's really my biggest thing is just, putting the homework and time in gotcha how much time do you spend like on a weekly basis how much time do you spend oh yeah that's uh it's it's i put more time in here than i do into my job um i mean it's it's checking trail cameras in the mornings um sitting there flipping through them while i'm in class i'm getting out i'm hanging stands i'm shooting my bow on a daily basis for you know, one, two, three hours a day with the guys. Um, right now, it's really a lot of time into it because we're feeding weekly up till, uh, you know, season's starting to open up and stuff. So, I mean, we put, I would say on an hourly, and definitely when season comes in, I mean, it's, I'm, I'm looking probably 20, 25, 30 hours a week probably to deal with hunting gotcha. <laughs> on top of school and work. So you're, go- you're working and going to school. Correct. Wow. How are you? Gra- how are your grades? Um, I got a, I am 120 hours into my college career as a biology major, and I'm sitting at a 3.5. So <laughs> not bad. It's all right. Yeah, it's not bad for the time I put into it. Very nice, Dusty. Would you have a question? Yeah, what uh, I, I want to know, and this is something that that Jay and myself is going to start asking: What drives you to put that kind of time in the woods? I think just at that time of seeing a deer you've worked so hard for, and and you know, I wasn't growing up on on trophy hunting, and I. I still, I love to take the does. I love to take the management books, but that thrill I get, I mean, I, I spend so much time, like I've told you, patterning deer or multiple deer a year that whenever I get that opportunity in there, it's, there's just, there's no feeling to describe it. I mean, and I'm even a little bit more, I think over the top than most people, cause I'm so technical with things like everything. I want to use the best stuff to, to have that much more success in the woods. But I mean, just that feeling of, of co- accomplishment, even before you pull the trigger, just to just to be in the presence of an animal, you know, of that magnitude, uh, it, it's just that feeling. There's, there's nothing else. I can't, I mean, there's not even a word to describe what I get. I, I just, I lock up, I freeze, I shake. I really don't even know how I come to come to even being steady enough to, to try and take him. Right. For sure. It's amazing what, uh, what a white tail will do for a guy or, or a female's mind <laughs> to chase after him that hard. Yeah. That is, that is, um, a feeling that I think, I mean, I've certainly had that. It's like, it just drives you daily uh to go do more of it and the more you get the more you want to do uh it's just this never-ending cycle you, and I don't, I don't know if you ever really feel like completely satisfied i think that's one of the things that you just you just get up the next day and you want to try to do that again um for something maybe a different kind of hunt or a different animal or you know there's always after you check your game cameras there's always a certain number of animals that you're, you're hoping come across your path yeah and there's just i mean there's there's nothing like i mean even if you're out there chasing chasing one that you want i mean just getting out there and and enjoying it is just just like it's a stress reliever for me like i said uh i mean i'm, I'm a pre-med biology major so uh the stress of class is definitely there the the, the weekend job i mean it, it's just a way to get out and just erase all of life's challenges and and just enjoy you know nature the noises the the fresh air all that it, that's that's what keeps me going every year. That's it. That's exactly it. Well, let's talk a little bit about your technique. Uh, you said that your most of your hunting is done kind of in a small town, city limits, urban kind of style. Correct. So, tell what's the smallest piece of land that you have permission on? On um, about three houses up from where I'm sitting right now has probably a seventy yard long backyard. Seventy yards. That's it. Yeah. Okay. The, That's pretty small. It gets small. that small. All right. And what's the largest piece you have? Um, I got a piece this year that is roughly about 70 acres. Um, that's actually in city limits. Okay. So what kind of herds are we talking about in these areas? Are they densely populated? Is there competition amongst hunters to hunt these animals or are they, are you some of the only game in town? Oh no. I mean, it's, and definitely now, um, there's so many, five years ago when I first started, I didn't have a clue. 
I could have went around and snatched up a lot of excellent land that now I know is out there. But uh, in the last five years, this area has just really taken off. Um, I mean, I, I was looking at land in a five-mile five radius or more the other day, and there's just not a spot that I haven't caught on or that I know somebody's not on. So, I mean, just about every huntable piece of small track of land there is, there's most likely someone on it or the people just won't let you hunt it. And so there is, it's extremely high competition. And that's just among the legal hunters, not to mention the guys who are just slipping in to places that nobody wants you to hunt and stuff like that. So, I mean, competition is, is extremely high. I mean, that's how, I mean, there's, there's no management really practiced around here. That's what's unfortunate because some of the deer I've taken would have been excellent deer in, in a year or two years. But it's one of those things that at the time that deer made me happy and. I know if he, if he would have made it past my tree stand to the next guy, he would have taken him. So we got extremely high pressure. And in certain areas of the deer population, there are high, you know, it's surprising we got a Gainesville. It's a it's city right up here. And it's, when I say urban hunting down here to y'all's urban hunting, this is a house to house every 20 feet next to each other urban. So, I mean, it's really wow. populated. And in places like that, I've seen 18 or 20 deer sit with <laughs> which is extremely surprising, and it's a very overpopulated area. So places like that, you still have high populations, but then again, you still got all the pressure of every hunter in the area hunting every backyard they can get their hands on. No kidding. All right, so it brings up the next question. What What's the attitude like of the people that live in these houses? Are they hunters too, or are they neutral? Yeah. Are they antis? What are we talking about? It, it varies a lot. Um, the place kind of where Tony Gainesville, there's a lot of antis. I've somehow, luckily, I haven't went up to a door and knocked on one, but every person I asked to, they're like, you better be careful. So-and-so, you know, they'll, they'll let you have it. So uh, the attitude, it, it varies definitely. Um, I run into several of my spots I have now are neighbors or antis and they come out there yelling at me when I'm in my camo going in the woods that they feed the deer and they watch the deer and uh, that I can't hunt them, you know, when I have written permission to hunt. And sometimes you just got to walk into the woods with them screaming at your back, uh, just, just trying to mess up everything. Okay. What, what's the, like the socioeconomic breakdown in that area? Um, it's, um, we have being on the lake, we're pretty, I mean, it's, it's a lot of the higher class area for here. So, um, I mean, we are fairly, fairly well in this general vicinity right around the border and stuff like that. But, um, we're most of where I hunt is too. Yeah. There's, there's a lot of, uh, high, high fluting people. <laughs> okay. All right. So I want to, I want to hear your approach. All right. So pretend I am a highfalutin, kind of snobby, rich dude that drives a Jaguar, and I have immaculate grounds. What do you say to me? And by the way, I'm you know, not, I'm the exact opposite. Of that. I drive a rusty <laughs> old Chevy pickup truck with over two hundred thousand. <laughs> yeah, no Jaguar. Well, let's, I'll see if I can pretend here. You know, well, my first thing is is I definitely don't go up to a door dressed in full camo, uh, a long grown out beard. You know, which I can barely grow anyways. But a person kind of like them, I try to get on try to get on their level. And as soon as I knock on the door, you know, the first thing they see is I've got a big smile. For some reason, they, around here, they answer their doors and they're hiding behind their doors like somebody's about to jump in. So, you know, the first thing I just go up, I've got a real friendly smile. I don't jump right into it. I kind of ask them how their day is going. I mention my name. I'm just going around the area uh, looking for some spots to to bow hunt in between school. I try to bring up school stuff like that, let them know that I am a, you know, I'm not just a backwoods guy that uh, I'm, I'm trying to do good for myself. And uh, and I tell them, you know, I, I see you've got a little acreage behind your place. And I was curious if uh, you're willing to give out some, some permission to, uh, for me to bow hunt this season. And, and from there, you know, I, I almost, I feel them out before they answer. If I kind of seen them leaning away, I'll try to jump in and in, in any way I feel I can. Um, and if, you know, if sometimes they jump right into it and then we talk for an hour or two hours after that and just off topic stuff. <laughs> okay. So you just, you kind of get to know them a little bit better. Yeah. I try to fill them out. I don't, you know, I don't go up there and just say, Hey, can I hunt your land? It's, I try to just put it in the most presentable, well-educated way that I can. And, uh, a lot of times, uh, cause that's what I think people are afraid they're willing, they're, they're willing to give out their, uh, their permission, but they're, they're so afraid of, of being sued over an accident and, or something, someone that, you know, they're going to let somebody on their land that's not educated and going to be slinging arrows through their back door. Gotcha. So you don't go for the sell on the first pitch. No, I, I try to open up with, I'm a, I'm a nice guy. I'm not here. I'm not here to rob you. <laughs> <laughs> I guess that would be a good start. Definitely. <laughs> um, okay. So that kind of describes who you're dealing with. Describe to us the landscape, but what, what's it look like to you? I mean, what do we, is it flat? Is it 
uh, hilly? Are we talking about fields? What are we looking at? Well, we have right here where I'm at, we have zero agriculture, you know, fields at all. There's no, there's not really any cow pastures. There's nothing. It's all mainly timber. Um, a lot of it's, it's real small tracks. Um, I mean, there is a little terrain elevation and stuff, but when I say that, I mean, you're talking maybe an elevation of 30, 40 feet. So nothing at all. It's just real small. I mean, like I said, it's, it's so hard. There's not really a good, a good description because it's all backyards. You now there's not a big enough piece of land to say we've got rolling hills. It's just real small block timber, really. Okay. So when, when you say field, what, how big is a field? Well, uh, we don't really have, <laughs> I don't have right. any fields where I'm at, but okay. uh, yeah. And so a field is just a backyard, basically. It's a patch of grass. Pretty much, right. yeah. And when you say timber, what's the timber? What kind of wood are we talking about? What are, um, kind well, of I've got some. I've got some some spots that's got some some thick pines, um, mature pines, and you know the underbrush. I've got open hardwoods. Um, that's that's pretty much it. Just just your standard hardwood ridges and your your small pine thickets. Okay, gotcha. All right. So now what's your strategy? Now that you, you've la- laid out the, the landscape there, we kind of know what you're dealing with. How big are these pieces of woods we're, we're looking at? What's What do the funnels look like? What are you looking for in the woods? Really? Um, see, now that kind of starts with um, when I'm out looking for land, I don't just go knocking door to door. I, I know this area well enough. Um, word of mouth where people have seen good quality deer in the past where I've seen deer. So I'm, I'm targeting areas that I know just in the general vicinity have at least potential for quality deer. So as soon as I get permission, I know there's a chance for something to be there. My first absolute step is is to find a, a GIS map where I can see the next big track of land where these deer may be headed. Um, any, just kind of funny to say, any backyards these deer may be traveling through to get to me. So I'm kind of finally, I mean, because when I say you're only you're only on an acre of land in a backyard, I mean, how much do you really have? There's no scouting. It's my first step after getting that and finding kind of where I think they may be coming from is, is set out trail cameras just to see what's there. Okay. I mean, I'm a very limited scouting abilities here. Like I said, I just gained a 70 acre track, but even then, um, there's there's just not much scouting to it. It's just it's so it's so grown up and so congested with with houses and, and buildings. Is, is, it, is it is it possible to say that you get more pictures of a guy on a lawnmower than you get deer traveling through the area? <laughs> well, I, I'm lucky enough to not have that. I, I get some power company guys every now and then acting like a deer on my camera, but. Uh, uh, I've done pretty well with keeping people out. Uh, I see more people in the deer stand though. I know that's a different story. So uh, quick question. What, what holds these deer in them, in them small areas? Are, are they just travel corridors or is some timber that they're headed to? It, it's really just a lack of place they have to go. Um, okay. you know, they're holding up, they're holding up in these little 10, 15 acre tracks. And then at night they're out in everyone's front yards eating on their bushes and all their fertilized lawns. Um, so that's, it's really just because they have nowhere else to go. Yeah, it makes sense. Okay, I got you. Now it's all kind of come together. Just I need you to explain that how it was coming through the people's backyards, and then so so what you're saying is you're trying to get them on a on a pass through, kind of either early morning coming back or late evening going to correct. And pretty much, they're not going to anything except for like shrubbery and green grass. And this is a very congested area. I mean, I'll be driving to my stand, and there will be six or seven deer laid up next to someone's sidewalk by their front door. No kidding. In the middle of the afternoon. I mean, that's intense, dude. They just, they just, they're just there. They have nowhere to go. So, okay, let me. Let me I'm on. <laughs> this has got my interest part. <laughs> yeah. <So> you're, <laughs> you're literally in these people's back lawn. Oh, exactly. Yeah. I mean, I, I don't know how many kids, you know, kids playing in their backyards, people walking their dogs, um, people using their bathrooms off their back decks. Unfortunately, I mean, it goes. Wow. There's, if anything you could expect to see in a neighborhood, you can. And like I said, that is on one of my congested. I do have some, like I said, the 70 acres, the, the 10, 15. They're a little less, you know, I don't have somebody right on top of me. But majority of it is, is yes. All. Have, you, have you had a situation where, let's say you, you sink an arrow in one of these deer and they take off running. Does it, does it get like up by the back door of somebody else's place? Oh, yeah. Um, I, I'm one of, Even if I have permission to be on land, I try to stay as as undercover as I can, because like I said, I don't want a neighbor seeing me who may be anti and then they're over there arguing with the people who are giving me permission. And then I get kicked off because of it. So yes, I have had deer run into the middle of green grassy front yards and just die over. And I'm immediately (laughs) jumping out of my stand 
before a car comes driving down the main road seeing this deer laid up in a in a, in a nice nice front yard closer to my home you're uh, you know my house uh, i've got some spots around you're more in your average blue collar homes um Dude, you, know, you like playing with dynamite. You're you're playing with dynamite there. Oh yeah, there's no doubt about it. <laughs> so you I yeah, like that, though. you got to be real careful, and the cover up has to be as planned out and as uh, expedient as getting into your stand and and getting ready, basically. Of course, yeah. There's a lot of times that before I go in, I have to kind of just act like I'm I'm just another guy in the driveway while the neighbors out in their front yard before I, I put my camo and my stand on and grab my bow and run off into the backyard. Uh, I got to be real careful with it and uh, and just and try, like I said, try to stay as undercover as I can, really. So not, so not only are you like a deer hunter, but you're, you're like a private eye to get to the back lawn without getting busted. Right. <laughs> oh, yeah. A little some secret agent stuff. I mean, it's 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 pretty stealthy. So, so a, a situation. Let's say let's get into one. Just curiosity sparks my interest here again. Say one of the antis has come out on you. What, how do you uh, how do you talk to them? Let's say they have you had one approach you like walk up and say, "Hey, this, what, what's going on here?" Oh yeah, uh, last season I was at a spot right here by my neighborhood. It's a twelve acre track, and it's literally all four sides of the land are uh, one side of it's uh, bordered by a gated really high class community the other two sides are kind of lower class homes so um, this is great we're, really this is really great we're, I love this. we're standing there getting ready to go in me and my buddy ryan and um, the neighbor starts walking down and you can just tell well she's coming down I immediately i know just i can tell the look at her for what she's coming for <laughs> what's, she what's starts, anti, tell me what an anti-hunter looks like coming down the sidewalk <laughs> I mean, she's she's speed walking. She's got her hands on her hips. She just <laughs> she looks like she's upset with life, really. Oh man! And, um, hey, you know she's so hungry. I walk, up, <laughs> yeah, I walk up to her just to be friendly, and uh, she starts kind of laying into me. Uh, just what am I doing? Uh, she feeds the deer and all this, and I tell you, you know, well, ma'am, uh, the landowners they're not local, so. I watch out for trespasser stuff. They let me bow hunt, which is all legal. Um, you know, within city limits, there's no regulation. You don't have to be any distance from a house or anything. And uh, and she just starts laying out, and I tell her, you know, I've got written permission. Uh, you can call the DNR. I, I know the head of DNR. Uh, he can tell you all the rules. And, and she just, she doesn't care. She doesn't care if I have permission, doesn't care what I'm doing or who, who comes. She's, I feed these deer. These are my deer. You can't hunt here. So I said, well, okay, ma'am. Well, uh, you know, and I just got in my truck and I went to another access point and I went and climbed my stand. <laughs> Dang. <laughs> that's crazy, dude. It's crazy. There's yeah. a lot of excitement. That's for yeah. sure. Yeah. Wow. What, what'd your buddy say? He was with you, correct? Yeah. He, uh, he kind of stayed, uh, hidden over behind the door. I think he kind of knew what was coming. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. You go talk to her. Yeah. Very nice. <laughs> Uh, so, Brand, let's uh, let's move on and and talk a little bit about your your gear setup. What do you what type of products? What type of bows you shooting? What type of uh, clothing, boots, soaps, all that stuff? What do you, what do you use? What's your normal repertoire? Well, well, starting you know just my basic get up and go in the morning. Um, I like to use all the scent, the scent away soap, shampoos whenever I can. Um, I wash my clothes in any kind of scent free or earth uh, earth scent stuff. Uh, Hunter specialty, uh, you know, just the, the standard stuff. Like that I don't use a lot of rattling, grunting in my particular area. I do know people in this area who have deer come running in, but um, so as far as products in the woods, it's mainly just me and my gear to to make the the hunt successful. Um. You know, but other than that, it's that's about as far as it goes. Gotcha. Okay. Um, what, you worry about smell, boots, um, rubber boots, that kind of thing. Correct. Yeah, I, I got. Um, I wear all the Under Armour, um, Under Armour gear. I use my muck boots, uh, all insulated, scent, scented stuff like that. I, I spray down going in the woods. So uh, I do try. Uh, you would think being in all this urban area that scent wouldn't really matter. And I tell you, these are some of the smartest deer I've ever hunted. Gotcha. I mean, they they come through the woods looking up in the trees and and they will scent check you in a heartbeat. Gotcha. All right, now I, I got to ask a question. I'm looking at your buck fifty photo of the the four of you, and and every every one of you has black face paint on. Um, if if this this were the 1970s, you'd be a rock band with eight inch uh, you know leather and heels called yes. Kiss, right? So what yeah. what uh, how important is the face paint to you? You know, in that picture, it was more of a kind of an effect thing. Uh, we definitely, we, I, I definitely think it helps break up our figure in the stand, uh, whether it's face paint or face mask. I definitely like to have something covering me up. Okay. Gotcha. 
I'd like to go on a deer hunt with you here, Brandon, and I'd like to have kind of Dusty run us through that and take us on a tour of one of your hunting setups with your most memorable deer hunt that you can think of. And uh, let's start, you know, a couple of days before the hunt and, and the prep. When, when, when are we going back to, Brandon? What year? Okay, we're going back to, we'll start in 2010. This is actually a year before I harvested uh, the deer I'm going to tell you about here. And uh, this this is a year, uh, this is actually when I started having a, all my success as a bow hunter. Um, I'm on a little, it's actually a 50-acre tract surrounded all by apartment complexes, houses, neighborhoods on all four sides. Um, but of the 50 acres, only probably about 15 of it was 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 hardwood huntable forest. Well, uh, it's 2010. I finally got a new track of land and I put a camera out for the first time. And week one, I have five bucks on camera. Um, like I said, I've never, this has never happened to me. And I'm truly a kid in a candy store at this point because I've, I've got bigger deer than I've ever seen in the woods on camera. And um, it took me that whole year of just tracking, whole off season tracking, hunting. I was able to harvest one of those bucks, but not the buck I wanted to that year. And uh, actually, and uh, so the next year in 2011, I, I started over again and uh, it come to find out 2010, the deer I thought I was chasing, which was an eight point in 2010, um, turned out not to be the same deer that I, that I got on camera the next year, which happened to be a 10 point. So yeah, so, uh, you know, day one of summer scouting, I'm getting deer on camera from the start, a whole group of them. And uh, I figure they're going to run the same pattern. So uh, all summer, I'm every week I'm in there, I'm, I'm walking this little bit of woods I can just to try and figure out where these deer may be entering my patch of, of woods because they're not staying there. And um, so it, it's taken this whole summer of preparation, feeding and scouting to the little bit I can. And uh, come, come fall, I hunt all the way until we open up in September, September 12th. And um, so it's taken me all the way into December, and I, I haven't yet laid eyes on this deer, and he's a big 10-point. A lot of deer moving all day, morning, midday, afternoon, and um, and I'm actually seeing some bucks I've never seen. And I'm the kind of hunter that I'm seeing deer, I'm moving to them. I'm not sitting out, you know, if I've got to go in a little earlier to get there, I am. So um, the day before I harvest this buck, I'm sitting on the edge of the power line, and I see a deer actually running in the backyards of these apartment complexes. And I couldn't get my um, my binoculars up fast enough to see what he was, but I knew he was a nice mainframe deer. So I decided I had a lock-on just set up right down in the ridge at the bottom of this really steep hill that went up to the apartments. I'm sitting here in my lock-on, and I just so happen to look over. I'm on this. I'm, I got a creek running through my property, and I look over, and this deer is standing in the privet, all you can see is his head, and he's looking towards the power line. And immediately when I saw him, I didn't have to count or anything. I knew it was him. At this point, he's probably about 45, 50 yards away. And to be honest with you, I think I almost blacked out. I'm not quite sure what all happened. I, I, I was I was shaking. I was nervous. I mean, I hate knowing what, what it is when, when there's time for him, when he's not already in shooting distance. So uh, he's standing here, and he's checking. You can tell he's trying to check the wind. And at this point, this stage of my hunting career, I'm not hunting the wind. I'm not hunting. I'm just, I'm hunting where I'm seeing deer. And, you know, this is four years ago. So, um, you know, I'm, I'm still in my learning stages of bow hunting. And luckily enough, I guess, I don't even remember what the wind direction was, but he's not sitting me. And next thing I know, he takes a cut and he's, he's starting to come straight to me. And I just tell myself, I just remember saying it over and over in my head. Don't try to shoot this deer until he passes you. The temp, you know, he was standing 15 yards from my stand to my right, wide open where I had actually fed him all year. There was no feed on the ground or anything at the time because we can't legally hunt over food here in Georgia. But he was checking that area, and uh, it took everything in my body not to stand up and draw and stick him at 15 yards. So he stands there, and it, it feels like hours. I know it was probably only seconds, like you know everyone says, but. This deer still working to me, and um, he starts working up the trail that I actually came in on, and he is standing at this point directly. I'm looking at him through the the mesh of my of my lock on stand, and mm-hmm. at this point, I know he can't see me because he's directly under me. That was just my main thing. I didn't want to try to stand and get ready while he was walking towards me. So he's standing directly below me, and at this point, I stand up, and he is fast as lightning. He throws his head up. He never looks up at me, but I don't know if he just, if he, he had a feeling, if he heard something, but he, he just starts looking around in a panic, but he doesn't move. At that point, he's kind of swinging his head around panicking, and I go in a full draw, and this deer is directly below me under in, under my stand. I'm, no more can I emphasize how, how close he was to me. 
and I stick my bow over the the uh, additional rail I had on this lock on, and I shot him straight through the spine, and he dropped directly in his tracks right under me. And at that point, not even seeing this deer walk off, no blood trail. I immediately, as an ethical hunter, I know he, you know, I know my bow penetrated his spine, went down through his cavity, but he's laying there, um, still still expiring. And I immediately after that shot put a second arrow through, you know, where I'm 100% confident his vitals are just just to make sure he finishes off as fast as he can. But um, at that point, I mean, I was so emotional that this is my, my second deer with a bow, my third buck I've only ever killed. And um, he, he happened to be 127 inches. Uh, and like I said, I know, know you guys, Dusty, uh, 150, you don't pick your bow up on, but uh, this – this guy, he hit the dirt and I just lost it. I, I mean, I was, I, I kind of teared up a little bit of, you know, just an excitement, all the, all the adrenaline just released. I couldn't stop shaking. I immediately just got on the phone and called my dad because ever since I've been bow hunting up here, we, we haven't really got to hunt much, but he's still been, you know, every time I get a good deer or something, I tell him. And so I'm on the phone with him and I'm just about kind of tearing up in excitement and, uh, he, he's laughing, t- talking to his boss right next to him, telling him I just shot a big 10 point. And uh, at that point, um, I just I just sat there and just let it all all vent out and just kind of understand what just happened. I just took the best buck of my life at point blank range. Um, and it, it just all worked out for me. It, after what I thought to be a two year trek, um, like I said, I'll tell you, uh, that deer actually the year before, dropped his antlers in the houses that the house that let me hunt he dropped both sides at their back porch and he was a typical 10 point the year before oh wow so i'd actually what i was chasing a big eight thinking it was him previously when it wasn't and i'd never had him on camera in 2010 like i thought i did so 2011 when i started chasing him that was actually the first year i had him on camera and chased him but uh so it it was uh, it just all unleashed Uh, I'd, i'd accomplished something i never thought i would at that you know that age Cause like I said, our, our number 10 in Hall County is a 129 with a wow. bow and, um, you that's know, difference. being at a hundred, 127 inches, uh, that's, that's still my best deer to date. Oh yeah. For your area, that's a stud, man. You know, and, and that's something that, uh, a lot of people don't understand that the different areas produce different antler growth. Yeah. There's, you gotta, you gotta realize what your trophy is. Oh yeah, absolutely. No doubt about it. You know, and I'm headed out to Jay's in November and, and it's going to be, uh, it's going to be a different hunt for me. Uh, you know, Jay's oh, yeah. big deer, they're 130, 140. Big yep. bodies, not real huge racks. Right. But, uh, man, heck of a story. Yeah, it, great it, story, it just, Brandon. It just goes to show you that it doesn't matter the, how big the, the deer is, that, you know, we all are feeling the same emotions on every deer we kill. Yeah, it, it was it was something else. And uh, it's still it's still one of my, my best hunts to date, that's, that's for certain. Very nice. Brandon, where do you want to take buck 50? What's the plan? You know, our, our plan in this is really... We see, and you know, not not to criticize anyone that's already in the industry and stuff, but we just we have a personal feeling as a group that that this generation, even at our age, not everyone at our age sees the things we see. We feel like that so many people are getting spoiled with with thinking you have to go out here in Hall County and shoot 150 inch deer, and if you don't, you're you're not accomplishing, you're not hunting. So our whole goal is that is to really just show that you know here in Georgia and Hall County, we're going to pull the trigger on 120 inch deer, but when we travel up Dillon. Illinois, we're going to pull the trigger on 150, 60 inch deer. So, you know, no matter what, they're all going to be trophies. So we just, we want to bring back the reality and, and just understanding what the foundation of hunting was. And, uh, you know, we, we've been working really hard as a group. We don't want to, we don't want to hit this industry by ourselves. We've been trying to build a, a circle in just a group of other shows. I mean, we've got a primal urge, a lost pelvic outdoors, ate up with it outdoors, we're building a circuit and a network of teams that all share the same values to show that it's not, you don't have to compete with other shows to, to be successful. I mean, we, we want to build memories and stories and, and that's where we want to take it. That's awesome. I like the direction of buck 50. That's fantastic. So as a hunter, what, what type of magazines do you turn to for knowledge? You know, um, down here where we're at, I've got a magazine called like buck masters and, uh, our Georgia magazine, GON, it's more of a, GON's more of a showcasing magazine of, of the different deer getting taken, but they have all kinds of write-ups of just tactics and strategies. And uh, being from local people, it has, you know, I really, I look at those kind of magazines, especially because it, that some of those tactics are, they're working here in Georgia and in areas that I'm hunting. So uh, I try to stick to more of local magazines over anything. And that's, that's, I've used a lot of those tactics to take a lot of the deer that I have now. Gotcha. If you had to give us one hunting tip and one only, 
The best one you got. What's that? What's your best hunting tip of all time? My best hunting tip. I'm a boots on the ground kind of guy, no matter how big, how small the land is. And I know I probably get a lot of criticism for that, but I have found my best accomplishment is just getting out and, and, finding the actual sign of these deer, not just relying on trail camera, but actually seeing where these deer are moving, whether it be a thousand acres or not really much walking on one acre, but you understand the point there. So yeah. get out and just and learn your deer herd, learn their movement, become become them while you're out scouting and just seeing how they're moving the land. Right. Absolutely. All right. So if you had this one thing, this one item, this device, this this one thing that you can't live without that drives you crazy if you leave it in the truck because you forgot it there, that's not your weapon or, or firearm or, or bow. What's that one thing that drives you crazy if you leave it in the truck? I'd have to say, um, although I do 3D competition and stuff like that, I'm pretty well at judging yardage. I love to have my range finder with me. If I ever leave that thing or drop it in the woods, I sit up in the stand. Just It just makes me that much more nervous, and I become that much more confident when I have it with me. Um, that way, whenever that deer's walking up, I'm not trying to double think, well, is it 30 or is it 35? I'm focusing on a ethical shot and that's the only thing I'm on. So I'd have to say my most important tool is a range finder to make my hunt successful. That's fantastic. Uh, Brandon, this has been just a great conversation. Uh, I thought we talked about a lot of great things and you painted a perfect picture of the areas you're hunting and how you go about it and gave me a visual a big uh, you know a, an exact visual of what to expect when you're hunting in georgia so i appreciate you for doing that and and uh it's been an honor talking to you yeah and i appreciate the opportunity uh, i had an awesome time just talking to some stories and <laughs> i'm glad i gave you guys a good picture of uh, what i have to deal with yeah. on a yearly basis down and, here in georgia and a few laughs too i have to admit that was pretty good yeah. <laughs> well, i'm glad you guys got a laugh out of it yep good it's pretty cool man very good. Thanks for joining us on the Big Buck Deer Hunting Podcast. Appreciate it, guys. So how would you like to have an anti-hunter come steaming down your driveway? No, it'd be the greatest thing since sliced bread, anti-hunter come talking to me. <laughs> it, you know, I've had a few encounters over the years, and, uh, you know, I wasn't exactly hunting like Brandon is, but you get into some of those areas where, you know, you have some people that might be partaking in a hike and they just don't like you being there. And uh, you, you can just tell they have this body language before they even start talking. You uh, know, before you, you, you know, before they speak. Yep. It's just like watching a big buck. You kind of, you learn the body language and you know what they're going to say. You know what they look like. <laughs> Absolutely. <laughs> you know, and one thing that's uh, guaranteed, as soon as a big deer hits the front end of their Mercedes Benz, they're always pissed off. Absolutely. There's I don't no, get that. Yep. There's no question about it. Well, thanks to Brandon Grindle for joining us on the Big Buck Podcast and kind of telling us what he's got going on with Buck 50. So good luck to all, all of his adventures and, uh, you know. Good luck uh, hunting over the rhododendrons. Uh, Dusty, do we have a, a Chubby Tines Tip of the Week this week? We do have a Chubby Tines Tip of the Week. What do you got? You know, talk to your farmer. Mm. See see if he'll leave you that 10 rows of soybeans along the edge of the woods or maybe that 15 rows of corn along the edge of the field while you're staying. Give him a little bit of a late-season food source right there in front of you. I'm sure if you talk to your farmer and offer him a little cash to cover the cost, cost of the crops, he'd be more than happy to leave you a little bit. Interesting. You think they would do that if you walked up absolutely. to them? Absolutely. Okay. Yep, absolutely. Right. You know, you offer up to pay for the crop that he's going to leave, it ain't going to cost you a whole lot. Right. Hmm. That's a good idea. I haven't thought about that. I may have to try that. Um, that's fantastic. Good, good, good tip this week, Dusty. Are you still doing the uh, fifty nine ninety nine or fifty nine ninety? Is it fifty nine ninety nine or fifty nine ninety five buck naming special? It's one of the above. One of the above. All right. Absolutely, I'm still doing it. Heck yeah! I was just checking, just making sure. Absolutely, you submit your buck picture, and if you'd like for me to name it, we'll call you and have you on the show and tell you the official name of your buck. Very nice, excellent. Uh, I also wanted to see we're on that subject of uh, raising money. You can also join us at bigbuckregistry.com forward slash pledge, and you can pledge your support there. Or you can also go to, if you just want to make a pure donation, bigbuckregistry.com forward slash donate. Yeah, and every every little bit helps us out. Keeps the show moving forward, and uh, it doesn't matter if it's one buck, five bucks, fifty bucks, hundred bucks, whatever you can offer us. We much appreciate it. And remember, your buck goes a long way. It sure does. 
helps helps us keep bringing these bucks to life and uh, archiving the stories forever in our vault of buck stories. So, Dusty, uh, where can we reach you when you're not hanging out with me here on the microphone? You can shoot me an email, dusty at bigbuckregistry.com. You can also look me up on Facebook, Chubby Tines Outdoors. You can also check out my other Facebook page, which is Chubby Gobbler, if you're a turkey hunter. If you want to hit me up on Instagram, at Chasing Antler. Jay, how can the people reach out to you when you're not on the mic with me or on the Big Buck Registry? Well, first and foremost, I'd like to invite you to join us on the iTunes reviews. And Dusty, we moved up to number 34 this uh, this week. You know, I think as deer season grows, as we did last year, we keep moving up the charts. Uh, but I'd love to get some more reviews going. So if you're a listener of the show and you have an Apple device, please visit us at bigbuckregistry.com forward slash iTunes and leave us a review. Do a search for Big Buck Registry and you'll find the review section there. If you would like to submit a buck to the page and get in front of about 170,000 followers and be famous for a day because you shot a nice deer, go to bigbuckregistry.com forward slash my buck. And we do have an app. We have two apps, actually. We have one for Android through the Google device and we have one for listening to the show on Apple And you can download those apps by going to bigbuckregistry.com forward slash APP. That's the Apple one. And if you have an Android, go to bigbuckregistry.com forward slash G app for Google app. Other than that, you can send us an email, j at bigbuckregistry.com, dusty at bigbuckregistry.com. And you can give us a call at 724-613-2825. Facebook is facebook.com forward slash bigbuckregistry or on Twitter. And that's twitter.com forward slash Big Buck Registry. So that's everywhere you can find us on social media. And uh, I think they covered that, Dusty. Big Buck, Big Buck, everywhere a Big Buck. buck. Yes, sir. Well, What a great show. Brandon, thanks for joining us. Thanks for all the listeners for tuning in with us every week weekend, 5 a.m. Saturdays. Man, it just pumps me up every show. Thrilled to have all the listeners. Yes, and can't thank you enough for tuning in. Hope you love the show. Leave us one of those reviews if you could. And, uh, you know, we're going to see you next week right here on the Big Buck Registry's Big Buck Deer Hunting Podcast. I'm Jay Scott. And I'm Dusty Fuller. This is the Big Buck Registry Big Buck Deer Hunting Podcast. We'll see you next week. Can't wait. 